Charles Spurgeon once said this, and I quote, I know not which is the worst of these evil spirits. The spirit that idly says, leave it to God or the spirit which goes about doing God's work without depending on him, end quote. Ultimately, these mentalities stem from having a three-arrow Christian perspective, which leads the everyday believer to embrace consumer Christianity. What is consumer Christianity? It's the kind of Christianity that looks as, at God as simply being a vending machine. You know, you see what you want in the vending machine. Maybe it's a payday. Maybe it's a Snickers. Maybe it's a pack of Oreos. Y'all bear with me. I'm a youth pastor, too. I got to make it plain. You see whatever you want in the vending machine, and you press the button. The button is A3. You press it, and here comes the Oreos, and you get what you want because you put your money in. Now, of the time, we think that God works the same way. Just because we invest the modicum of time that God is supposed to give us exactly what we want. You know, God has a way of allowing us to press what we want on the vending machine and give us something totally opposite. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. If there is anything Hear me this morning. Hear my heart this morning. If there is anything that has stymied the growth of the modern-day Christianity movement, one would have to agree that the leave-it-to-God mentality and the do-God's-work-without-God spirit has slowed the mandate of the Great Commission. Although it's not quoted, preached about, or recited often, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, still reads the same. It says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Then the next verse says, leave it to God. No, it says, go you, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, to consider, to participate in all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teach them to be obedient. Teach them to adhere to my word and lo I am with you don't that sound good all ways he mentioned all power and then here he mentions always even until the end of the world turn over to Mark 16 15, 15 through 20 and you'll see Further understanding what God said about his great commission. Mark 16, 15 through 20 reads, And he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If they reject your preaching, if they resist it, if they scoff at the unadulterated word of God, just know that your preaching was not in vain. Listen, even when the world rejects the truth, the preacher's job is still solidified. Hello, somebody. It's our job. See, if you are a husband in, at home and you take out the trash and you put it in a trash can, set it out front of the house, you did your job. Now it's the trash man's job to pick it up and take it to the dumpster. But when you do your job, 
that's it, and that's all that matters. The Bible says in verse 17, and these signs shall follow them. There shall be signs that chase you. Them that believe, there shall be signs that follow them that believe, and in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall, watch this, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Listen to me this morning. If we have a leave it to God mentality, we forfeit the power of the Holy Ghost. We lose our wherewithal to lay hands on the sick. We lose our ability to preach and to teach to all nations. It's our job and duty to fulfill what God expects from us in the word of God. Am I saying anything this morning? We can't leave to God that which he has left to us. We have an assignment. And our assignment points to his great commission. Jesus has already come in the flesh. 100% human and 100% God. And he's not going to come back in that form to die again. He's dead, but still alive. But he's coming back. But in the meanwhile, we are to occupy until he comes. And we are to get busy about his word. In the book, Tell Someone by Greg Laurie, says you can share the good news. Greg Laurie says something that I would like to share with you this morning. It says, no doubt about it. New believers are the lifeblood of the church. They also are the lifeblood of the Christian. We all need a new believer in our life. We need to deepen and ground them. In turn, they reignite and excite us. You show me a church that has a constant flow of new Christians coming in, and I will show you a church that is stagnating. We in the church have a choice, evangelize or fossilize. The church is not constantly bringing in new Christians. Then the church is stagnating. But if we don't evangelize, then we fossilize. And that goes for the individual. You become an artifact in the kingdom if you don't spread the news. There is a whole lot to spread. Oh, my God. When we look at the good news of God's word, turn over to James 2 and 14. I'm working my way back to 2 Kings. I'm not lost. This GPS is working. I'm, let me lay this foundation. I want to show you something this morning. We can't take the mindset that says leave it to God. James 2 and 14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Is faith the only prerequisite to being a believer? Or should there, something, should there be something that accompanies our faith? Verse 15 says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, if they're cold, if they're hungry, verse 16, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, go and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what good is that? What doth it profit? You know, we're not supposed to withhold from people 
things, watch this, that I do them. <laughs> watch that now. Which I do them when it's in our power to do it. The Bible says, even so faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Faith alone is cold faith. But faith is warmed when the blanket of works covers that faith. Verse 18 says, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou, is do, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. To just believe, to just believe you, 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 you haven't gone that far. You're at the category of a demon or a devil. Even the devil believes. Uh, he, listen to the devil. He said, son of man, why have you come to adjure us before our time? Why have you come to cast us out before our time? Even the devil can testify of who God is. I'm reminded of a time that Bishop laid hand on, hands on a woman here at the church. And she says, I, don't touch me because you are clean. And you are holy. Even the enemy can testify of the faith of God. But what takes it a step further is works. Verse 20 says, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Then he goes on to give some examples. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, Abraham didn't just say, Lord, I hear what you're telling me to do to sacrifice Isaac. I believe I'm done. We're going home, and me and Isaac go going to play PlayStation. No, that's not what he did. He had to take a journey. And it's that journey that would tell whether or not you have the works. He had to make his way to the mountain to sacrifice Isaac. And even Isaac had some faith. Isaac looked around and said, uh, I see the fire, I see the wood, I see the sticks. Where is the sacrifice? And see, God today is asking the church, where is the sacrifice? God desires that we have the sacrifice of works. Then it says, verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was injected into him. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called, watch this, the friend of God. He was God's friend, but what put him in friendship with God was not a leave it to God mentality. It was a I will do mentality. Verse 24 says, you see then how that by works a man is justified, my God, and not by faith alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. God even takes people who are sinners, saves them, renews them. Even the harlot was justified by some works. Let me tell you something. If we're not justified by works, if we don't do anything beyond the mentality of leaving it to God, we're no better than the harlot. We got to be justified in our faith. Lastly, verse 26, for the body without the spirit is dead. It's dead. So faith without works is dead also. With this in mind, the other extreme is a spirit that says that we can do God's work without God. Let me tell you this morning, you can't do anything. Nada. Not a thing. Without God. Song says, without Jesus, I would be nothing. Without Jesus, I would fail. Without Jesus, I 
would be drifting like a ship without a sail. See, Israel tried this over and over again in church history. Israel tried to do the work of God without God. They tried to further the commandments of God without God's blessing and without God's help and without God's stamp of approval. And you can see this in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Let's turn there this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 4. You don't mind if this Bible preaches. You know, I, I don't believe that a preacher should read one text and then give you 55 minutes of personality. Because my personality is not going to redeem you. You're going to be redeemed by the word of the Lord. And that's going to be the antiseptic that cleans you up. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? What does the Bible say? By taking heed according thereto by the word of God. 1 Samuel 4 and 1 says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array. They got ready for battle against Israel. And when they joined the battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men working without God hear me church will get you killed in the kingdom you, you, let me tell you something the thoughts and the plans to do are of God what good is a plan without God's covenant of blessing upon that plan verse 3 says and when the people were coming to the camp the elders of Israel said, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? Why did God kill us? Why are we dying on the battlefield? Why did 4,000 of our men get killed? Then they said, watch this, after the fact, watch this, after the fact, they said, let us go fetch the ark. We've lost 4,000 men, but let's go fetch the ark. Let's go get the ark and bring it here, and maybe the ark can help us. Listen, the ark is needed not when you're in battle. My God, you need the ark before you get in battle. Listen, take the ark with you. And I'm glad today that we don't have to worship an ark. I'm glad that the ark doesn't have to be hidden in the holies of holies behind a curtain that was 30 feet high and 60 feet wide. I'm, I'm so glad that the ark of the covenant is in us. In you. But if you have a move without God mentality, you can't have the ark. And we need to get the ark back home. We need the ark of Jesus to rest in our lives as never before so that we might do the work of God. Listen, there's a revival coming. There's a work that God seeks to do. There's a move of God's glory. And this revival cannot take place with Ichabod written. It's going to take the ark of the Holy Ghost. It's going to take the power of God dwelling in us. We are God's workmanship. We are God's vessels in these last and evil days. And God is looking for someone to anoint. Looking for someone to rest his hand upon. God, let me tell you something. The thing that, uh, Lord, help me today. The thing that changed my paradigm. The thing that shifted me at the age of 19. As a young man playing football in college, the thing that got me was the anointing of God. I saw on one hand what it looked like to be demon possessed. And that thing sobered me up. I was in a service and saw a demon cast out of a person and saw that person purged. Saw what demons can do to you in the natural. I ain't talking about Halloween. I'm not talking about Freddy Krueger. I'm talking about in the flesh. I saw it with my own eyes. But then juxtaposed to Satan's power. 
I saw something. I saw the anointing of God. Man, I wanted that thing. Young people, hear me this morning. Get Jesus. Get the ark. And hold on to the ark. As you're matriculating through middle school and high school, there'll be people that will seek to steal the ark. Listen, perversion is an ark killer. Sex before marriage is still an art killer. And sex while in marriage without your married partner is still an art killer. See, you remove God's glory when the ark is placed in carnality. We got to make sure that our eye gate and our ear gate it's fixed into that which God desires. In other words, we have to take our spiritual adapter and plug in to God. Am I saying anything this morning? So the people went to Shiloh that they might bring for, from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts which dwelleth between the cherubims. Look at that. God's spirit dwelled between the cherubims. The curtain in the temple was 30 feet high. The cherubims behind that curtain were 15 feet high. And above those cherubims and between and in between them was God's spirit. And the curtain was so thick, it was wider than a man's palm. And the curtain was used to separate carnal sin of man from God. And so they are now in their sinful state trying to bring that which rejects sin and use it as a mechanism to help them. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, you know them, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. Bad boys. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout. So that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. There was a noise going on, but it wasn't the right noise. It was sounding cymbals and tinkling brass, a kind of noise. It was not the noise that God Desire. Verse 7, and the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods. These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Look at this. The enemy respects God more than Israel respected God. Hear that this morning. The enemy, they were trembling because of the noise, and they knew how great and terrible that God could be, but God wasn't getting ready to move on their behalf. And the enemy was trembling because they remember what God can do. You ought not let a sinner outbelieve you. Oh, ye of little faith, how dare you let a worldly person, someone call and vow, have more trust in God than you. Let me tell you something. We bear the stripes of our trust. Sometimes trusting in God will get you in trouble. Sometimes trusting in God will lead you through some dangerous valleys. Sometimes trusting in God, you, you might have to cross some rivers. But nevertheless, trust in God. God will make a way out of no way. Verse 9 says, be strong and quit yourselves like men. O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. We read earlier that 4,000 were slaves. And now 30,000 footmen were slain. 
34,000 people were killed simply because they moved without God. Verse 11 says, and the ark of God, watch this, was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. They took the ark, and the ark was removed. And by losing the ark, they lost God's blessing. And trouble and hardship and woes broke out for them. And when you turn over to Deuteronomy 21 through 12, you find another story that enlightens us about what happens when we move without God. Deuteronomy 20 reads, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, a room this morning, when you go into the world and you see giants and enemies that are bigger than you, don't be afraid. See, in this life, you will encounter things that are greater than you. That's why God didn't make you greater than him. God says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Listen, the odds will always oftentimes be against you when God is in a thing. You know God is in it when the numbers are stacked against you. Verse 2 says, and it shall be when you come nigh unto the battle, and the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say, unto them hear O Israel ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies let not your hearts faint fear not and do not tremble neither be ye terrified because of them for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies watch this to save you and the officers shall speak unto the people saying what man is there that have built a new house and have not dedicated it let him go and return to his house lest he go in the battle and another man dedicate it in other words if you just save enough money to get that down payment to get that house credit score good you can get what you want if you have a house and you haven't dedicated it, go back home and dedicate that house. Because God does not need you fighting for him with a mind on the house. God in battle needs our minds to be clear. Verse 6 says, And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and have not yet returned to eat of it? Let him also go and return into his house, lest he die in the battle. And a man eat of it. In other words, if you play in the vineyard and you waited, you sold your time tilling the ground in the fields, and it's harvest time, harvest time, and you still haven't eaten of that field, go home and eat. Go get your lima beans. Go get your collard greens. Go get your sweet potatoes. Hello, somebody. Because your mind going to be about that pot on the stove. And not about fighting on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Verse 8 says, And the officers shall speak further unto the people. And they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well. In other words, if you got somebody out there on the battlefield, you can tell that they're scary. You make sure you point him out and say, hey, general, send him home. He don't need to go to battle with us. You know, in football, you know, we could tell who was scared before we ran out the tunnel. You know, oftentimes you will have a leader that will come and look at everybody in their eyes before you went on the football field. 
just to see if anybody was scared. And I heard one of my players one day when a, a guy was f afraid and timid and he could see it in his eyes, he said, man, if you're scared, go get a dog. You see, you, you, you can't be afraid when you go into battle because it might make the next person faint-hearted. Ain't no need for me to be getting ready to go into a, a treacherous battle and I'm getting ready to contend for the faith and I look to my left and you scared. And I look to my right and you scared. Now nah, you go home. Let me tell you something. I feel like Esther. I'm going to sing. If I perish, I'm going to see the king. If I perish, let me perish. And I'm going to die falling forward. If there's anybody that believes it, that in here, give God some praise this morning. And the Bible says, verse 9, and it shall be when the, when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is from found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve you. And if it will not make peace with you, then it's time for you to go in and besiege it. You know, this brings to light, and I'm going somewhere, what David said in Psalm 20 and 7. David said, some trust in chariots. Tell somebody to roll your wheels here. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. So you got to put your trust in the Lord. You can't trust in worldly stuff. You can't trust in the enemy. You can't trust in your power. Your trust must be in God. Proverbs 21 and 31 says, A horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory is of the Lord. Let me tell you something this morning. If you want victory, your victory is going to be in Jesus. It's not going to be in trusting in horses. See, a horse and the chariot appears to be strong. It represents military strength and military power. But the horse and the chariot can do nothing against you when God is on your side. I don't know about you this morning, but I hear in my spirit, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I don't know about you today, but you ought to grab hold to this word. You ought to say today that I'm not going to be a three-arrow Christian. I'm not going to allow the world to beat me down because my trust is in God. If your trust is in God, give the Lord some praise this morning. Isaiah 31 and 1 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the abundance of chariots and the multitude of horsemen. They do not look to the Holy One of Israel, and they do not seek the Lord. So God always told Israel not to look to the horses, not to look to the chariots, not to try to gather a large army. Because if you put your trust in the army, you will not trust me. That's why God had to take Gideon's army down and bring it to 300 people so that God can get the glory. Yes, your trial is hard. Yes, your trial might be difficult. Maybe the odds are stacked against you. But let me tell you something, that's a good place for God to step in and for God to get the glory. I don't know about you this morning, but I've tried to trust in chariots. I've tried to trust in horses. But never have I met a power like the Lord. I don't know about you this morning, but your arms are too sharp to box with God. I want you to know today that God's ear is not too heavy 
that he cannot hear. Neither is his arm too sharp that he cannot say. But if you put your trust in Jesus, God has a way of turning things around. High five somebody this morning and tell them God going to turn it around for you. Hallelujah. Text says, but they do not seek the Lord. But over in our main text, we see in 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14 that a king by the name of Joash goes to Elisha while Elisha was on his deathbed. This king goes to Elisha to inquire of him. You know, you got to go to Jesus when the time is right. You, 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 you can't go to God when you think that it's the time is right. But you got to go with God and go to him from the beginning. The text says now Elisha was falling sick of his sickness. Whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and cried over his face and said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Stick a pin there. I know you've heard that refrain before because in 2 Kings chapter 2, those are the same words that Elisha said to Elijah when he was taken up in a chariot of fire and a chariot of horses. When Elisha saw Elijah go up, he said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Some scholars believe that here Joash was trying to get a triple portion because Elisha had received a double portion from Elijah. But here this unfaithful king comes to Elisha treating him like he's a magic potion trying to get some of his power and a triple portion. And the Bible says in verse 15 and Elisha said unto him take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hand, signifying that God's hand was on the king's hand. Let me tell you something, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And God turns it into whatever way that he desires. I don't know about you this morning, but I got a feeling that God is going to turn some things. He's got power to turn it in your favor. God knows how to flip the script. God knows how to take that thing that's ailing you and turn it on his head. Can I get a witness? Anybody in here got enough faith to believe that God is going to turn it around? If you believe today, give God some glory in here. I say give him some glory. I say give him some glory. If you believe that he's going to turn that thing, give him some glory. Listen here. The Bible says in uh, verse 17, and he said, open the windows eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Listen here. He was not on the battlefield when this first arrow was shot. He was not going against the Samarians when this arrow was shot. He was not at Aphek 
when this arrow was shot, somebody going to catch this? He was not going against the Syrians when this arrow was shot, but he was in the chambers. Which leads me to my first point. Number one, most battles that we win in the kingdom are not won on the battlefield, but they are won in noonday prayer. Yeah. I don't know about you this morning, but I come to tell somebody that if you're getting ready to go against an enemy, if you're getting ready to fight against the enemy, maybe you had received a bad report. I come to tell you that before you go to the doctor's office, you better grab your bow and you better grab your arrow and you better shoot an arrow in the chamber. I don't know about you today, but prayer still works. Listen, as a young man in college, I got to tell you that it was prayer that brought me through. I remember when I changed my class schedule to set my schedule not around my major, but about my, but around my master. I changed my class schedule so that I could come to noonday prayer. And in those days, there were men like Elder Scott Hunter who would be in noonday prayer. There were men like Moses Day that would be in noonday prayer. There were men like Elder Cooper who would be in noonday prayer. And sometimes when I came in early, Elder Cooper would look into the sanctuary and say, young man, get the coals hot. And what that meant, meant was get the prayer started. I don't know about you, but I wish I had some young adults that knew how to get the coals hot. Because if you get the coals hot, God will give you victory from the chamber. I don't know today if there's anybody in here that's going against the battle. You better shoot an arrow in the Holy Ghost. You better shoot an arrow in the spirit. And when you shoot your arrow, you proclaim the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Give God some glory right here. So he shot one arrow and proclaimed the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And he said here in verse 17, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And then he told them to take the arrows and he took them and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And this king of Israel grabbed that bow and those arrows and he shot the arrows in the direction of Syria. And he shot the arrows three times and then he stopped. And then, then the prophet gets mad with him and tells him that you should have shot all of the arrows. And since you did not shoot the arrows, you're only going to defeat your enemy three times. I come to tell somebody in here, don't stop shooting. I know it might be difficult. I know that you might be weary on the battlefield. I know that you might be tired. But whatever you do, don't stop shooting. Uh, God uses instrumentality. God has a way of taking simple stuff just to bring about his glory. With Moses, he used the Red Sea and the rod that Moses had in his hand. With Samson, he used the jawbone of a donkey. With David, he used a slingshot to kill Goliath. And then I see David killing a lion and a bear with his bare hands. When bringing down the walls of Jericho, he used a ram's horn and the voice of the people. With Gideon, he used 300 people. With Jephthah, he used a sword to feed the multitude. God used a lad's lunch. And when it came to the feast, 
when it came to the feast that was going on, the men, the priests needed to get over the river Jordan. And God told them to just step your feet in the water. And the waters began to divide him. I wish I had somebody that did not mind stepping into what God has already said. If I be a man of God, if God has said something and he's proclaimed it, he's got power to do it. Whatever you do, don't stop shooting. Whatever you do, don't stop shooting. Shoot until the battle is over. Shoot until the victory is won. Shoot until the enemy falls. Shoot until your help comes. Shoot until you feel rejoiced. Shoot until your power comes. Shoot until the battle is over. Is there anybody in here that got enough faith to, to say I'm going to shoot until this thing changes? You ought to get your bow in the Holy Ghost. I dare somebody to get a spiritual bow. Grab your bow. And I want you to figure out in your mind and think about what you're shooting for. Somebody is shooting for a loved one. I hear you, God. Let's shoot an arrow for Deacon Smith. Let me tell you this morning, God is able to lift him up if it be his will, but I dare you to shoot an arrow for Deacon Smith. One, two, three. Did you shoot it? Turn me up right here. Did you shoot it? Well, if you shot that arrow, I want you to think about your family members. Think about your loved ones that are still in sin, that don't know God. I dare you to shoot an arrow. One, two, three. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance is going to be all right. I got a feeling. I feel my help coming on. I got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Shoot another arrow. This arrow is for God to anoint you to close 2018 strong. You might have gone through some hills and some mountains in this year, but I dare you to shoot an arrow for God to close this year strong. One, two, three, shoot. And I dare you to shout the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Shoot your arrows. Now you pull it out. Whatever you need, whatever you desire, whatever you're waiting on, shoot. Shoot. I dare you to shoot. <laughs> Shoot, shoot your arrow, shoot until the arrows are gone, shoot until the battle is over, shoot until you got Goliath's head in your hand, yeah, shoot, shoot it here, I dare to shoot, keep on shooting. Give God some praise.
is it all right in here? Is it all right in here? I dare to shoot. I hear the word of the Lord saying, I answer, have not seen, is, have not heard the good things that God has in store for you. But you won't get it if you shoot three times. You got to unload the clip, baby, and keep on shooting. Shoot, grab faith, and shoot your shot. Give God some glory. Now that's how you shoot your arrow. Praise him. Shoot your arrow, Brother Ghost. I wish I had somebody that had enough faith to pick him up and put him down like this man right here. Shoot, 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 shoot. Hey, 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 hey. I dare you to do it. Hallelujah. Give him some glory. God said, let the praises praise me. looking for a sharpshooter, a person who's been trained in prayer. If you are a prayer warrior, that'll make you a sharpshooter. God said, let the prayer warriors come forth right now and shoot with a sharp shot. And if you shoot in the Holy Ghost, God is going to turn that thing around. Give him some glory. Yeah. Hey, hey. Praise him. Praise him. We're going to be out of here in a little bit. We're getting ready to go home. But I wish I had some sanctified people that didn't mind helping me this morning. I'm a youth pastor, and so I do youthful things. I wish I had somebody in here, Elder Rocket, that didn't mind. Shump it, Wayne. Shump it. Shump it, Wayne. Shump it. Shump it, Wayne. Shump it, Wayne. Shump it, Wayne. Shump it, Wayne. Shoot. Shump it, Wayne. Shoot. Shump it, Wayne. Shoot. Shump it, Wayne. Shoot. Oh, shoot. Come on and give us some glory. Glory to God. Come on and shoot it here. shoot an arrow 
good God Almighty, from your hands. And then you can shoot an arrow with your knee. But here come the final way. And if I tell you, you got to do it now. The last way to shoot an arrow is with your feet. I dare somebody in here either to shoot it with your hands or shoot it with your knees. But whatever you do, shoot it with your feet and give God some praise. My God. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Basketball. Coach Lester. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You are a basketball coach. Great God from on high. What does a three point shooter do when he has found himself in a shooter slump? What does a basketball player do when he finds out that the shots that he used to shoot are not going down anymore. What does a basketball player do when he notices that his rhythm ain't quite right? What did they do? Keep shooting. What did you say? Keep shooting. I don't know about you, but the basketball coach said that if the shots ain't going down, if you've lost your rhythm, whatever you do, keep on shooting. Shoot until you get your rhythm back. Good God Almighty, I feel my heaven here. Shoot until your favor come back. Shoot. I want to tell Facebook Live, don't trust in any other God. Don't trust in Allah. Don't trust in Buddha. But shoot your arrow, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Keep on shooting. Hurt him 
more seconds. I'm going to pray. We're going to pray. And then we're going to raise the offering. Then we're going home. I wish somebody had faith. Like the Hunger Games. Who's that lady on the Hunger Games? Huh? That be shooting the arrow? Huh? Cap. Listen, y'all to get like that lady on the Hunger Games and just shoot your arrow. Because God will take care of you. Yes, he will. <laughs>